I'm going to seriously geek out on you with some governance thinking. Um, and I really think that we are at a point in time in our co-op history where we need to up the level of our thinking about our governance structures to the same degree that we have uh, raised the bar uh, within our business operations. So what does Gifford Pinchot have to do with cooperators, you might ask? Well, uh, for years, I've had his maxims to guide uh, foresters in public office on my office wall. And if you can't read those words, I kind of did it on purpose, right? Because I want you to be curious enough to go look them up and maybe print them for your own office wall. Uh, in 1909, he gave a series of lectures at the Yale Forestry School. And uh, some, much of what he says articulates the principles of servant leadership really compellingly. I'm going to confess that I also put him in small print because I think uh, Gifford maybe would have been shocked to see a uh, woman could be a forester. So some of his language is a little, a little unfortunate. But I'm not going to read you my very, very most favorite one of his maxims. I'm just going to read you a couple just as a teaser, right? Um, I love uh, that he says, he emphasizes the importance of communication as part of servant leadership. Find out in advance what the public will stand for. If it is right and they won't stand for it, postpone action and educate them. But note that he doesn't say, don't act. Use the press first, last, and all the time if you want to reach the public. Get rid of the attitude of personal arrogance or pride of attainment of superior knowledge. Listen, here's, here's my second favorite of his maxims. And I think this speaks directly to the principle of courageous leadership. Don't make enemies unnecessarily and for trivial reasons. If you're any good, you'll make plenty of them on straight honesty and public policy, and you need all the support you can get. So he is acknowledging that conflict is a part of public engagement, public service. And as cooperators, when we choose to step into a leadership role, we are choosing to put ourselves forward uh, as servants to the whole that makes us up. Now, I started my career as an environmental lawyer. So one of the controversies that was really live during the early years of my careers uh, involved this little critter who's a spotted owl. And uh, he brought into uh, dramatic awareness the uh, different ways that people could see this forest, right? The old growth forest in the Pacific Northwest as seen by people who made their livelihood from harvesting timber from these forests and as those who saw it as a place of recreation. Dramatically divergent stakeholder perspectives and yet people were able to come to some comfortable resolution. We have moved on from that. I think to govern in the new normal, we need new structures, new skills, and new applications. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes here about some very geeky ways that we could potentially bring some new concepts into our governance thinking. And then I'm going to kick it over to a couple practical applications with the help of my good friend from Mountain View Market. My colleague Michael Healy is fond of quoting Michael Hartunian for the principle that democracy isn't the voter choice, but rather it's the conversation or argument that precedes the choice. And conversation, I think, is essential to successful cooperation. The ICA blueprint acknowledge specifically that we're going to have to examine and challenge existing practices of co-op democracy and look for evidence of innovative practice and do that as an adaptive strategy where we're continuing to try something, see if it works, correct, and then try again. That's what our stores have been doing. Eleanor Ostrom in 2008 published a paper in which she cites a fisherman from my home state of Maine uh, as a successful example of collaborative management of a shared common resource. I think one thing that we should acknowledge is that we, as participants in retail food co-ops, are playing in a system of allocation, resource allocation. Who buys what from whom at what price is fundamentally an issue of resource allocation. And so Ostrom's principles of adaptive government, governance I think are helpful and instructive to us in reorganizing how we look at what we're trying to do. Because there is no right answer except the answer that we come up with for each of our cooperatives. And it may be that what makes the answer right isn't that it is objectively right at any point in time in a continuum, 
but rather that we come up with it through a right process, that we feel good about it, or we feel good about the way it is not perfect, okay? So Ostrom has five concepts that I'm just gonna throw past you really quickly. First of all, that we need to define and share information. She talks a lot about boundaries, identifying what is relevant to the issue at hand. And I think you'll find in some of our most bitter conversations and disagreements, take Syracuse Real Food Co-op's disagreement about whether or not we should have cash registers, okay? That was a bitter disagreement. That was almost as bitter as the one about whether or not we should go corporate and hire a general manager some years ago. When you have that conversation, one of the interesting things is what's relevant? What are the boundaries of that issue? How do we frame that conversation? And if you frame it too narrowly, you exclude people, right, and perspectives. So be really curious and courageous when you consider what information is relevant. Conflict is inevitable. I am married to a conservation biologist, and through him I've become aware that human wildlife mediated conflicts are particularly intense and emotionally charged, just as in the spotted owl conflict, where they involve people's livelihood and they involve things that we actually hold very sacred, uh, important wildlife. Dealing with conflict, um, there's a paper in the field of wildlife biology that really woke me up to a need to think about conflict very uh, at an intellectual level. First of all, let's just recognize that there are many different lenses, many models of conflict resolution that we can draw from, and that we should probably be really curious about learning about those models. I'll point out that mediation skills are always going to be incredibly important, because I would point out when somebody is part of my cooperative and is willing to stand there and shout at me at an annual meeting or express serious emotional distress out in the street in front of the co-op, they're not exiting the co-op. They are still part of it. So there's an expression of intention to reach a resolution of the conflict. As long as we are in the co-op together, we intend to reach resolution, which I understand from my mediator friends is essential to success of successful conflict resolution. It's important that everybody is agreeing that a solution is desirable and in fact possible. Uh, two models from the wildlife uh, field that I thought the application was just really helpful to me in sorting out uh, thinking about co uh, resolving conflict. One, if you think about the levels of conflict model, uh, just highlights that there are different ways we bring ourselves to a dispute. So if there's a car accident, you can imagine the first level, right? Then second, imagine that the car accident is happening between two drivers who just three weeks ago had a really acrimonious breakup and they haven't seen each other since, okay? That's a social context to the underlying dispute. And it is very likely, three weeks raw, pretty unresolved conflict. So unresolved disputes often fuel what's happening, the landscape, the context of the dispute. And then finally, I'm a New Englander, imagine one of the cars is from Massachusetts and one is from Maine and it's hunting season in northern Maine, okay? So there can be identity-based conflicts, right, that come out of our social and psychological needs. As a Mainer, I really need you to know that even though we were part of Massachusetts, we are not now, and we never will be again. The third conflict resolution strategy I just want to highlight for you is something known as the conflict intervention triangle. It's very cool because it separates substance from relationship from process and illustrates the importance of each of those in conflict resolution. Eleanor Ostrom emphasizes the importance of rule compliance, and she says that rules are effective when participants consider them to be legitimate and fair and enforced, and that they're likely to achieve their intended purpose. If you think about when uh, policy governance was first adopted by retail food co-ops, some people found it abhorrent and strange and not legitimate, right? And yet, over time, we have seen that the policy governance system actually can introduce some really needed structure and effective way of thinking about decision making. However, Ostrom's emphasis on rule compliance reminds us that it's really important to keep the policies alive and dynamic. And that's why I've asked Mountain View Market to come talk just for a minute, because strategically, we want to be sure that the policies and rules that we have adopted in our co-ops are vital and live to our communities at the time, at this time, and they need never be an excuse to avoid an important conversation. 
So providing infrastructure for governance. Ostrom emphasizes nested structures for gathering information from stakeholders at the level at which they are engaged. So in the fishing disputes in Maine, right, engaging lobster fishermen with lobster buyers, with lobster regulators, right, and getting everybody into the conversation. You have to take into account the local community, the economy, the culture, and make sure that the people at the broadest level of decision making have a way of being informed by the wisdom of everybody else at each other level. So we're connecting. And it may be that we really need to think about redesigning how we structure our governance so that everybody does have a true and legitimate stake in the decisions that are made in the co-op at the appropriate level. Uh, change happens. Ostrom says we need to embrace it, and I say we might as well. My husband's uh, work on the Galapagos giant tortoises reminds us that if you see the dome tortoises in the upper corner, uh, where it's very lush and wet in their ecosystem, they haven't had to adapt those big uh, high dome shells in order to reach up to the high trees for their vegetation. They don't need to. But we are going to evolve and change. It is happening. Our organizations are living organizations, so we may as well embrace it. Here's my home co-op, the Syracuse Real Food Co-op, and I want to show you our ENDS policy because we are, we are adorable. Uh, we are small and we are strong. And this is our ENDS policy, which really motivates us and has motivated us for at least 10 years. Uh, we see ourselves as creating a thriving cooperative commerce in our local community. And we continue to push out and stretch how broadly we define that local community. And it engages the board to this day. Uh, Weaver Street Market in Carborough, North Carolina, has really embraced the challenge that's presented by the ICA blueprint for the cooperative decade. Their ends uh, acknowledges explicitly the importance of widespread participation for not only owners, but potential owners. That's a recently adopted ends that is engaging and enlivening that community. And with that, I'd like to just invite Sochil Torres Small from mm, Mountain View Market and Las Cruces to just have a few words about your ENDS revision recently, which has been so inspiring and a delight to be part of that process. 